to one, Christina. <laughs> Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of Archaeologists in Quarantine. Today, we are joined with special guest David Ian Howe, archaeologist, anthropologist, and science communicator. You may recognize David from Instagram, which is how we met. How are you, David? I'm doing okay. How are you doing today? Not too bad. It's been a kind of a, a, a crazy weekend for me. I don't normally do two streams at a time, um, but next week is a special episode. So why not do today? Make sure it's fine whilst we've got you because you're a busy yeah. person. We know how you are. Um, so it's an absolute pleasure to have you today. Oh. <laughs> and Strider, how is Strider doing? Because everybody does love him. He's beautiful. Yeah, he's a good looking dog. Uh, he is currently eating like a he likes treat puzzles, so I like I stuff treats and like these like old plastic things, and he has to or rubber, he has to work to get them out. It keeps him occupied. But when he gets that done, he'll come bang on the door and wanna go for a walk. That's <laughs> fine. Don't worry. I mean, we are talking about the domestication of dogs today, so it's quite fitting, I think. <laughs> so, how did you come to specialize in dogs? I mean, that's how I see you online. I think online virtual is a science communicator. I see you more so on your popular Instagram account, which I cannot pronounce. Ethnocology? Ethnocynology. Oh, ethnocynology. There you go. Completely okay. off. <laughs> so where did this word come from? Where was it first mentioned? There's a Canadian anthropologist named Brian Cummins, and he wrote a book called Canadian or First Nations, First Peoples, Canadian Ethnocynology. Uh, or something, I can't remember the exact title, but um, it was that, and he coined the term, and it just means the study of dogs and humans in cultural contexts. So it's quite fitting then for your account. Yeah, yeah. And I yeah. shot him an email and he said, yeah, you're free to use it, so cool. Amazing. So for those yeah. who are not familiar with David's account, um, it's full of educational resources in the sense of showing us how dogs have evolved in like domestication really isn't it it's all about domestication and how we see them today because they are arguably the po most popular pet depends would... if you're a cat lover or a dog lover so yeah. <laughs> generally one of the two you grew up with and so i mean i'm both i'd have to say um yeah. but i think what we could do actually if you'd like we could maybe show your account okay your instagram account i am pull it up yeah, why not? Let's show, just show the world your awesome account. Sure. Uh, to the top. So yeah, here it is. Um, so recently I've been like kind of experimenting with different colors, seeing like if I could do a different like palette, I guess. But uh, when I first started, I was like crazy anal retentive about like wanting to make it all color coordinated. And then you could just see that 2020 has like <laughs> changed that way up at the top. But um, yeah, you can go down um, and scroll through it. And if you hover, I guess on your phone, you have to click it, but like you can click on a post and the top usually has the title um, and you can read a little bit about it. Um, usually it's like a piece of art or it's my dog. Here's him as Anubis. Uh, I'll tell about that. Yeah. <laughs> and um if it's one thing I really like to do is have sources. Uh, and if there's obviously an artist that I'm using, um, I try to ask them if I can find them or get into contact with them. And if I can't, I either way, I put their name and try to link to their account or website. Um, yeah. It's awesome. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, it's like the modern way now, I think, of educating everyone is visually appealing and things like that. So why right. did you, how did you even get into, not even how, why maybe did you start this account? What kind of inspired uh, it? Because it is uh, a niche. Yeah, I would say that <laughs> I just got sick and tired of, well, there's, there's two, two things. I got sick and tired of telling people at like bars or like my friends, just like random dog facts or anthropology facts. And they're like, okay, I get it. <laughs> you And like, I just had a lot of stuff to talk about and not anyone to like talk to about it. Um, so I just decided to put it on the internet and I don't have the patience for like blogs. And I didn't even know how to start that because it's not, you know, 2002. 
So I, <laughs> I just started the Instagram. Um, I really enjoyed that. And then uh, I had pitched an idea to Ted Ed, uh, like, wow, two, three years ago now. And they uh, really liked it because they hadn't done a dog video yet. And I ended up writing the script for him. And that kind of like was the kick I needed to be like, oh, I could actually like be a science person now. And that was kind of mm. cool. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad that that motivated motivated you because otherwise we wouldn't have met and we wouldn't have been a part of Archaeology Avengers. A mug? <laughs> I do have a mug. I gotta get a mug. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you one. Yeah, literally. So it's actually my logo here. <laughs> And then I've got, yeah, the Avengers one. Yeah. So there's David and Strider. Look at this Strider, it's so cute. Oh yeah, I forgot so, he's in the yeah. yeah, there he, he is. He is in it, it's so shiny. So my light's shining on it, but yeah, there we go. And there's me guys, if you don't know, that's me there. So yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, I'll, I'll sit from this side. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so today is gonna be about the domestication of dogs. When does that start? And do you have any images for us to show maybe to support when we have, when we have a little chat? Um, yeah, so I have a PowerPoint that I usually give. I'm not gonna give it cause I can go on a, like a rant of like 30 minutes or 60 minutes or so, but I can like just kind of go through like the pictures. Yeah, sure. Um, we show, oh yeah, I gotta share my screen. But where is that button? Oh yeah, I need to be on. Just like screen. a nice, like a general overview. I guess yeah. just like a nice little introduction and then at some point David will be making a, a full length video about this I'm sure. Yeah I'd hope so. <laughs> I'd hope so. <laughs> um, yeah so uh, I guess when I teach my like lab students or when I teach uh, or I like, give a lecture I uh, always start with this image just to like you know give it context. And uh, obviously it's sad. And like, I'll ask people like, how do you feel about it? And they'll give me obviously sadness or, um, you know, wow, or like, <laughs> why would you show this to me? And then um, the reason like, and those are all good answers, right? So I say that's good because what I want you guys to notice is like these people are ancient. Uh, they're not like modern people bearing a dog, obviously. And uh, it's important to know that because like back in the past, it's important that we remember people were human. It's like, it's easier for us to think of them as cavemen or like you know, Neanderthals or something like that. But um, when you use it in that kind of a term, but they were, they were human just like us. And I think dogs help bridge that gap. Uh, if you can use dogs to kind of uh, lure people into learning about anthropology. And that's kind of what like my account does, I would say. Um, so yeah, it just helps put that into perspective. Um, so I'll just kind of go through really quick, but dogs are the genetic descendants of a, an ancient gray wolf species. Uh, they used to think it was the gray wolf or, um, like a, a modern version of it, but it's probably some common ancestor between modern gray wolves and modern dogs. Um, but yeah, however, like the genetic signatures today show that they are like descendants of wolves. Um, Canis lupus familiaris is like their species name. So the dog, the I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it's technically dog wolf friendly. Um, and like people often think like, well, how the hell is a Chihuahua? Um, like, you know, the same thing as a Great Dane because it looks like two different species, but they, they literally are. Uh, so I'll, I'll just breeze through real quick. Um, yeah, right, this one, we're just from wolves. Why is there still wolves? A little outdated now, but still pretty funny. Um, I love it. That's cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, there we go. Okay. So I'll skip through the geology part. We don't need that. But um, basically dogs and wolves have been around, not dogs, canids themselves have been around a lot longer. Uh, humans are new. We all know that. Um, there's 38 subspecies of wolves uh, all over. Uh, gray wolves, red wolves, timber wolves, the whole thing. And wolves are the largest of living canids. Dire wolves went extinct, um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're the largest still. And wolves live in complex social groups called packs. Um, two to four families of wolves is what makes a pack. And what's interesting is that's usually like a male and a female and their various offspring is a, a family. And wolves, it's debated, are monogamous. They have, in the sense that they raise their young together and like the mates kind of stay together. Um, 
it's not like they get married or like they stay around for life but they they invest in the offspring together Hmm. um yeah five to ten wolves if i'm talking too fast you can just stop me whenever but no it's um, fine cool so so i'm guessing they've done studies on wolves if they've watched them haven't they i'm guessing in these sort of reserves to yeah and like a big like issue is that a lot of wolves now are obviously captive or they live in a national park where they're encroached upon by people so their behavior is way different than it would have been in the past so it's hard to kind of infer how it would have gone so we got to just speculate and it, it's it causes issues but it's like it's up in the air but it, it's pretty cool to think about at least um, yeah so uh environmental pressure uh they can that's not relevant for now but uh alpha males as we just like I, we talked about is like the captivity thing that's like a recent thing wolves like in the wild don't necessarily have the alpha male thing that's like a weird misnomer um but what is natural is an outcast like they get rejected from the pack and have to go do their own thing so just keep that in mind um do they then, survive if, if they're alone wolves um so that's the thing uh they can do it they can hunt on their own they can scavenge uh, like they can get little birds and things like that, but they do, they need a pack and that it's kind of as like this will do, or like this PowerPoint will show, it's like, that's why they, they get along so well with humans. We need like our pack dynamic with each other or not pack, but the sociality between each other. Mm. Yeah. Um, I should probably, yeah, hang on. Let me think about how I'm going to do this, but they go through some pictures. Uh, but yeah, wolves are wolves are pack hunters. Um, and just like humans, like we are too, like back in the past. So that makes us um, work together in such a way that like uh, humans would have studied how ancient wolves hunted. Um, and this is going to give me a seizure, so I'll stop. But uh, yeah, we would have seen how it was or how they did it. Um, and it, it, it's like very complimentary. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think of a way to make this fast. Don't um, worry, it's fine. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it's interesting, honestly. It's one of those things that people don't, they're interested probably when they have like a dog or a cat, but a lot of people wonder how have they come to this stage where they seem so besotted by us, right? Especially dogs more. Dogs are known to be loyal. Cats are, you know, feed me and right. then, you know, let me out of the house and that's it, more independent. So I think it's interesting for, for a lot of people to understand how, if we can show through science, how this has happened through evolution. So it's, it's very interesting to see. Yeah, I think so too, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, wolves are uh, persistence hunters, meaning they, they chase their prey until it's exhausted. Uh, they don't like outrun it like a cheetah kind of thing. Um, and humans do the same thing. Like obviously we're not as fast as the animals we hunt, but we have to or create complex tools to get them from a distance. Um, and we don't need this here, but um, let's see. So yeah, uh, wolves, the dental osteology, I'll show that picture in a second, uh, but they have what's called carnassials in the back of their mouth. And that's what they use to crush bone. And that's like what a, a wolf's like adaptation is in a way and they can break down the bones to get the marrow on the inside eventually. And if you look at dogs, like they always chew in the back of their mouth here, but if they're like biting down on something, they use the front of their mouth. It's pretty cool. Um, it also makes squeaky toys like pretty morbid, but um, cats, a uh, similar thing. They have mouths that shear, uh, so they'll go for the spine or the throat, less so than going for the legs of like a, an animal. Um, and we domesticated them or they domesticated themselves is the debate uh, to get mice out of our granaries. So after agriculture. Um, and an interesting thing is that wild cats and domestic cats aren't that dissimilar. Uh, they kind of look the same. It's not like a wolf and a chihuahua. So this is where that debate of, you know, are they domesticated or not kind of comes. And I think that's always fascinating. Um, like, have and, they domesticated us, right? <laughs> right. And, like, have you ever had a cat? 
Yeah, I have I have two rescues, yeah. Yeah, so it's like they're beautiful. They can be very loving and awesome pets for sure. Like I love cats. I've had one myself, but they're just they behave so differently than dogs in a way. And it's like this cool when you think completely about it. Completely different. I think that's why I think I can imagine cats being a bit more they're domesticating us, they're using us. Like I feel that more than when I had a dog right. before. <laughs> yeah. They just like rent the house and just kind of take it over. Um yeah. Oh yeah, here we go. So here's the picture. You can see it's like the dogs have more like what just like leverage in their mouth than like a cat does. So it's just like their hunting strategy, like their anatomy, which is pretty sick, but has nothing to do with people. So I'll move on. But uh, you can see these traits in your dog, right? And this isn't my house. I found that on the internet, but <laughs> it looks like it was in 1984. But um, like dogs will rip stuff up because they have this like innate need to just you know, hunt. Um, and, uh, the reason I'm showing this is that people picked up on this in the past and they would have been like, Oh, like these things are really good at doing that. Uh, we need to figure out how to exploit that. Um, or it happened naturally, which I'll get into, but just to, if it happened naturally, uh, it's interesting how that kind of meshed together with us. Um, and then, so we start breeding dogs eventually. Um, this is kind of jumping forward, but I'll just keep this in mind. Um, so if you look here, you have a wolf, right? And that's like a wild animal. And then you have the Saluki, which is like the, the bread dog. This has a giant like chest and I, like it's way slimmer and it has like a more aerodynamic body build so that it can just pump all of that oxygen through its body. It has a huge heart and lung set. Uh, to just run fast. So we evolved those to hunt rabbits and I believe like for racing early on and like early Egyptian breeds and stuff. So you're just taking a running wolf and exacerbating it until it gets to what you want. And same thing with border collies. We saw, I mean, these are a way later breed, but early herding dogs, like we had them later, they noticed how wolves would stalk prey just like this here in Yellowstone. And then uh, we kind of exploited that and dogs that were really good at doing that, we kept breeding with each other so that we got a perfect hunting tool. So it's just a, a bio weapon in a sense, or like a bio tool. Pretty sick. Um, it is really cool. Yeah. So here's the part that's like the, the meat of it. Um, domestication theories. We don't have to talk about Darwin here, but the first one is dog domestication or natural selection theories. And the first one would be self-domestication. And uh, there's a lot of words on the screen, but the gist of this one is that it's probably that wolves had in the past had a, a predisposition to either being afraid of humans or not afraid of humans. And if they were afraid of them, they would have like ran away in fear, um, hence flight distance, um, fight or flight. Or if they could stand to be around them longer, they would have like been able to, you know, scavenge and get some food from our camp. Um, so this is where that outcast, the pack comes in, which is a question you asked earlier, which is dope because that answers this question, right? Like how would they survive? So that one straggler is going to be, I can't hunt a bison alone. So I have to go hang out with these really loud, you know, apes that have fire and get their food. <laughs> and like, essentially like that's what they would have had to have done. Um, and that's probably what a proto dog came from. So um, pretty cool. And then uh, the next one would be, yeah, so I just said all that, but uh, yeah. So you can see like has dogs in a garbage dump is a very common thing you see like on TV or it's just like a, a trope essentially, or a meme. Uh, it's just what dogs are bred to do or evolved to do at this point. Um, and yeah, again, like we, the, the dog shaming memes were like a huge thing when I was in college. I don't know if that's still a thing, but. Um, Just for our viewers at home, if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat box and we will ask them either during or after the presentation. Yeah, um, you, if, yeah, if you have one, like while I'm talking, just throw them in, yeah. Um, the next one would be symbiotic mutualism. And this is just the idea that uh, wolves and humans are very similarly 
not designed, but like uh, we have similar social structures, right? We have the packs, we have um, sociality, we have uh, the same game that we hunt. We live in the same environments. Uh, ancient humans in Eurasia, where wolves would have been, really like to eat reindeer because they're just so abundant. Um, and there's so many in a herd that they were easy to you know pick out. And that kind of, in a sense, like was inevitable then that humans and wolves would have come together and like clashed or either had to like work together um, or just come to like a mutual like, all right, humans just exist or wolves just exist around me and I got to deal with it. Um, just had to, you know, come to terms with it. Um, and if humans, you know, got bit by a wolf, they would have probably killed it because that's like what humans do. Uh, and those wolves would have died off quicker or like around human camps, at least in those areas. And the ones that could stand humans longer or not bit them or anything like that would have been able to stay around. And they're in a sense rewarded for that behavior. So this in the same way would have created some kind of proto dog. Um, and this is technically relevant, but um, Plains tribes uh, in the Americas here would wear wolf pelts, I believe this was, um, oh man, I don't remember what tribe it was. I think not the Pawnee, uh, Lakota, Shy I can't exactly remember, Ojibwe. Uh, either way, I forget which tribe it was, but they would wear wolf pelts um, and stock up on bison. And of course the bison thought they looked like wolves, so they would behave in the way that they would around wolves and humans exploited that. So the idea that these people at the bottom I've cited kind of proposed is like maybe ancient humans did the same thing and use these tactics learning from wolves. Um, and the last one would be, um, or second to last one is uh, the Pinocchio hypothesis. And this is just the idea that people grabbed wolves out of wolf dens um, and wanted to raise puppies or abandoned wolf pups were in, you know, the mother died and they were like, those are cute, I'm gonna raise them, so. I mean, they do look really cute. Right. Yeah. And I think it could be a combo of this with the other ones, right? Like it just could have happened. Um, I mean, isn't, there are stories of uh, lions, isn't it, who have ad adopted calf antelopes, so baby antelopes. Like I remember seeing that, I'm sure it was an antelope that a lioness had adopted. Like, you know what? There are things that do happen. Yeah. So maybe it's something like that. Guys, what do you think at home? Why, why and how do you think we ended up having this close bond with a wolf that now has become a dog. Like it's it's really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's one more little theory, and then I can kind of end it, or I can keep going into like the anthro part, or we can just chat. It's up to you. Um, Let's keep going. It's fine. We can chat as we. Oh, okay. we do have a question, by the way, um, we... from Lisa. Um, just quickly. Um, why did domestication happen when it did? I imagine humans and canines were living near each other for a long time before domestication. So you kind of have just answered that, um, but anything to add? Yeah, I would say that like modern humans or behaviorally modern humans at that time, um, culture kept growing um, like ever more complex with each other. And obviously like you can track that with cave art and how uh, complex tools we're getting and it just got more sophisticated and sophisticated and I think uh, without writing like knowledge of you know how the environment works or wolves and things like that like you know their behavior would have gotten passed down more coherently and they could have I'd like um, I guess taught about it better and said like, or here's a coherent plan that lasted more than a generation. Like, okay, let's breed these things. And it didn't like lose when that tribe died. Like it was more of like a cross-cultural thing. Um, I would say, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. Um, and then uh, one of the more recent ones uh, is trapping for furs. And this is just kind of like an insurance policy. Uh, if you're, it's the winner, and it's freezing and all the animals have left and you're running low on food, you can trap wolves outside. And it might sound insane because they're like obviously vicious, but uh, you can't let like a, like a reindeer or a moose like 
graze outside your village and without like fencing, right? Like you can't do that, mm -hmm. but you can throw wolves like scraps of food because they eat the same thing as you. So it makes sense. And then there's also evidence of people uh, cutting wolf furs or like cut marks on bones to get furs. Um, and it's protection. They other things wouldn't come stalk you if there's a wolf there. Um, and yeah, emergency food. I think it was, it's pretty neat. I haven't really thought about it too much, but um, yeah, I thought it was cool. Let's see. Uh, the Fox experiment, right? They um, this is this could be a whole PowerPoint in itself, but a one paragraph synopsis would be that they were trying to breed foxes to be more docile. And in the process, they bred more foxes to be more aggressive. And the aggressive ones went like crazy and they were super aggressive, but the ones that became more docile ended up looking like dogs. They started to bark, they tears, tails wagged. They could like, they really liked people. So kind of just shows that it's possible to do really quickly. Um, there's a lot of questionable stuff with this study. Uh, uh, like the cages and stuff weren't like the most humane, um, but uh, it still in essence shows that there's like, genetic stuff happens that quickly. Um, but in the past, they probably weren't doing it um, with that intention. It just happened naturally over thousands of years, not in, what is it, 12 generations, I think is what, 20 here. So it's interesting. Um, so let me see where we're at. Um, yeah, so I guess I just do this quick, but out of Africa, people leave Africa, right? They get into Eurasia. Uh, there's the last ice age. It's a harsh environment. Easy food uh, was rare. Food needed to be hunted. Um, we had to live in caves and structures. So then you find these wolf things, right? And we're efficient, intelligent, and adaptable. So are wolves. Uh, we run into them often. And then wolves are there during the day. You're going to have to compete with so one day you're hunting, a wolf follows you home, you start to scavenge. So you throw out a bone, right? And you, you teach this story, like it becomes a, like a, technically what a meme is, like it's a, a cultural uh, like theme you like put down or like a, like a trait you do. Um, and then you notice which ones are nicer, you start to name them, you live around your camp. You could either in that one theory, raise one of the pups, right? and then they become human's best friends. So they have similar social systems. We are, I mean, wolves are debatably monogamous. Humans are debatably monogamous. I'm sure some of us have been on the crappier end of that stick, but like it, in a sense, like we mostly are. Um, and a behavioral rearing is in that sense for monogamy. Um, these proto dogs would have realized this quickly and they could rely on us for food it's a good trade-off for them. Nothing wants to mess with the wolf, really, and nothing wants to mess with the ape with the spear. And they protect us and help us hunt. So we start to selectively breed the pups. And the fox experiment guy, uh, Belyaev, called those aggressive foxes dragons. Um, and he would praise the dogs, so like the, the domestic foxes. So in essence, at the end, you get a dog. Uh, and it's debated, like, are, are dogs our greatest invention or our is fire, is art, is, you know, Netflix, I would argue. But like, uh, I, I say dogs definitely, I don't think they're the, our greatest invention, but they significantly changed history for sure. And I think it's important to consider. That'd be, that'd be that. But. Well, that's a really nice overview and it's probably making a lot of us think a little bit more because I guess we can't really, you can't really say when that happened, right? When the earliest dog was. I know in Siberia, if I remember correctly, in Siberia is the earliest dog that we found, the Siberian pup. Um, yeah, to, to date, one that is like the most questionably doggish, yeah. Mm. And we did have a few questions regarding, for example, even the artwork from Angelina. Hey, Angelina. She was asking hey. what inspired that um, piece of art. You know, the first one in your slide and what I used as the promo. Yeah. Um, Honestly, the first answer I'd say I was an emo kid in high school, but uh, the other one would be there's no image of it that I've seen. I saw like a very small pencil drawing of it in a paper I read, um, 
it was a indigenous American burying a dog. Um, and then, uh, I wanted to have like a representation of like what that would look like because dog burials are such a common thing around the world that like are pretty cool. Like we have an image of what human burials are constantly, like we do them all the time, but then like the dog burials aren't usually as celebrated, but they, I think they, the cultural aspect of it is an interesting milestone. So it was, that's why I had Atori do it. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and for those who don't know, Atori is the artist um, that that first image is, is seen in it and his details are in the description box below. Um, there was a few questions regarding taming a wolf. Uh, one is from Sophia. Hey, Sophia. Sophia is a seven-year-old who loves wolves and dogs oh. in general, especially wolves. Um, and she was curious to how, why it seems that wolves are the hard, one of the hardest animals to tame because in circuses you'd see like bears and tigers, but you don't really hear, or, or lions, but you don't really hear, you know, you wouldn't see a wolf. So is there anything to do with the character of a wolf, like, and to do with taming in general, um, that can be seen, like, you know what I mean? Like, so, and then for example, how, if that sort of character of, of a, a species, how they would then become domesticated. I mean, I guess in, in dogs, we do see that they can be, you know, if they don't like you, right. you know. So she I wonder if it, hmm? She's seven years old? Yeah, she's seven years old. I've, I'm stumped. So that's like a good, <laughs> I'm very proud of her. Uh, I, I would say like, I, it could be because like, I think wolves are a little more like common for people. Like it's not as exotic as like a lion or a tiger to see at a circus maybe is what that would be. But like, that could be the answer, but they're certainly like tameable. It's just like, maybe they're like i don't know i've never really looked into that are they harder to tame than a lion i don't know i guess we just normally see wolves in packs don't we that's what we associate yeah. a wolf with like if you ever go to these sort of outdoor sort of safari safari sort of settings you know where you can drive around and they have like the animals just chilling i yeah. don't know actually if they have wolves i can't remember actually i'm I've sure there are places where you can go but not like hmm. they're usually in packs yeah Maybe people don't find them as interesting. Who knows? It might actually be that simple. Maybe they're so close to a dog that, hmm, yeah. something to think like, about. Thank you, Sophia. Yeah, good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we have another one. Oh, thank you, Ark Burb. Um, so some dog trainers train based on the false notion that dogs are attempting to be the alpha. What kind of things would you say to these folks from this perspective? Yeah, uh, I see a lot of this in like, it's really funny. Like there should be a Real Housewives kind of show of like dog trainers because it would be great to watch because they all hate each other. And <laughs> they like have different um, like perspectives on how these things work, right? And some think that you have to be, assert yourself as the dominant person or the pack leader and be um, alpha and your dog has to be submissive uh, but then other people say like, no, like treat it as your equals um, and just positive reinforcement and don't be negative to them as the best way to do it. Otherwise it causes behavioral problems. So um, my experience with Strider, the really intelligent dog, uh, and I've never had a dog with that. Uh, I think positive reinforcement is much better than negative reinforcement because negative reinforcement, I haven't had any, like he still does those behaviors even if I've negatively enforced them, but he does less of those behaviors when I positively reinforce him more about it. You know, like, I, I don't know if that answers the question, but um, the more, most of the trainers I've worked with and like enforce the, like just positive reinforcement, not the alpha thing, uh, but you're still, in a sense, like, it's weird, right? Because they, they'll tell you, you're the alpha, you sleep in the bed, your dog has to sleep on the floor. But like Strider came preloaded with, I sleep on the floor, like sleeping on the bed with you. So like, I don't, it's weird. It's a good question. Um, 
was also I went on a tangent, but yeah, there's I think there's merit to both sides because it's clearly worked for people. But mm. And then we have, if you have any more questions, folks, now is the time. Um, let's see, jim, jim, jim. let's go with, yep, yeah, again, somebody is agreeing, you know, maybe it's to do with the fact that they are, they look quite cute, that maybe that is the paternal parental instance of like, of early humans who maybe took on the, the pups. So it's, but then I wonder though, what we see as cute, to 1,000 years ago, what they thought of being cute, you know, the attractiveness sure. of an animal. I do wonder sometimes. Um, and then yeah. another another comment, actually. I don't think we'll be able to, but um, there must have been a time when we stopped eating wolves and dogs. Have you found this in your work? I'm not sure if you can answer that. Um, I mean, we took that. Yeah. We know that they took the fur, so we just assume that they would have eaten the meat. I can connect it. They would have eaten the flesh. Um, um, I would say it's pretty common throughout prehistory all over, like in the Americas and Europe, Asia, everywhere. Um, and yeah, I, um, I don't know when it like stopped wherever, because like I haven't really looked into it, I guess, but I know like just archaeologically, like dogs are eaten all over because they're just food. But mm. Yeah. Yes, there, but it was probably their version of chicken, like how chicken is mass produced now and eaten. It's yeah. just an, it, another source. Yeah. And if the bison aren't there that winter, like what else you got? Yeah. Mm. Let's just see. One more question, folks. Let's see. Let's see. Dum, dum, dum. Oh, I like this. Instead of TED Talks, it should be pet talks. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, actually. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Sometimes how um, understanding, I mean, of course, we can't talk to them, which is a shame, but right. uh, it'll be interesting to see how, like actually how the interaction will be between a wolf and a dog. If there's been an experience, see actually like the characteristics, how how close or you know dis dissimilar are they? I wonder if they are still quite similar, aren't they? In, in many ways, it's just They're... now the humans of the pack. Yeah. Um, there's one experiment that's cool. Uh, I'll be quick about it and not tangent, but the, <laughs> it's like they put a wolf and a dog in a cage, like two separate cages and with like an ability to get out, um, they had to work at it. Uh, the wolf struggled, like the humans leave, the wolf struggles and struggles and struggles to get out and will try everything it can do. Or it was a coyote, I think, or wolf, I can't remember everything it can do to get out. Um, and it won't stop. Like it will not give up on it, but a dog after 10, 20 minutes or so will always just lay down and stop because they're evolved to be codependent with humans and they'll just accept defeat. Um, if it's like a junkyard dog or wild dog that, you know, has no other option, like I'm sure when it wakes back up, it'll do it again, but it, they can accept defeat faster because they have that instinct of like, and eh, they'll come back. So it's interesting. One nice last statement, actually. Yeah. Um, really interesting there about the experiment, actually. It does make you think. Um, do you think we have a chance in the 21st century to defeat animal cruelty and re-educate the society so that it realizes how you know, these creatures are and how important they are in our lives? Maybe the fact that, um, okay, they are a source of meat for some people, a source of nutrition, but in the sense of maybe animal cruelty, maybe the mass production. Yeah. A bit more generic, but. That's that's where I would go with it. Um, I mean, I, I would hope that like all cruelty and like that would go away as soon as possible, um, like in hum humanely, mm -hmm. or I would, everything should be as humane as possible. Um, but like, like with chickens, right? Like if it's a mass produced chicken farm, like I find that like just so sad, but like if it's ethically done and you know, it's a, you're a farmer and you've done it that way for years, like, you know, it's, that's different. But it's literally, um, so I went to a chicken farm when I was maybe like 10 years old, I saw it and that's literally what made me stop eating meat. 
I was like, I, can't. Yeah. I was like, I can't do that. Like once I saw yeah. how they were in, I was like, no. Yeah. Sorry, it's slightly a bit off off tangent, guys, but um, no, it's yeah. Bad, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, anything else you'd like to add? Actually, so we've covered um, the potential ways of how the different theories of how domestication did occur from wolves to dogs or proto dogs. Um, anything else you'd like to add? Um, we've covered it. No, uh, I'm really glad uh, we finally got to chat, uh, especially last night. I'm really glad we got to finally talk. Um, yeah, I'm glad you got to do this. This is really fun. Oh, it's been awesome. Seriously, it's been good. So everyone at home, don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe to get notified for the next live streams. David's information as well is in the description box below. And one thing that David does do is make these really cool short one minute videos that his uh <laughs> that his sort of caveman alter ego <laughs> does with him with this awesome backdrop but if you haven't put attention on this yet if you just see behind david he's got this amazing wall how long did that take you to do um i think collectively probably 24 hours but i did it over like months of just like working at it you know um, I have 24 hours of footage, I should say, of like recording me build, building it, but. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna, I've just been requested to show a video to everyone before we go. Uh, let's see if I can find one. Or do you think you can find one, David, from your Instagram account? Yeah, um, does this Let's sound? do that, that'll be quite fun. Um, so what David does is especially uh, via TikTok and Instagram, he makes these really cool educational short videos. And it's quite important because it's very thought provoking as well as educational and it's done in a comedic way, which is I think why it's so successful. Um, and then of course, every single post he has has an educational um, blurb with it. So. Here, I'll go to my YouTube so I can play and pause it, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. amazing. There you go. <laughs> Peanut butter. Peanut butter? It's not my favorite brand, but you know, there's a pandemic going on right now and they didn't have the one I wanted, so I didn't get a GIF. I usually prefer Skippy. They don't have peanuts in your side of the world, do they? No. So you open it. Oh, dude, that smell. And yeah, you just so take it. In it. Preferably you use a spoon, but like, I'm not. You just do whatever you want. Do you put it like in your eyes? No. Huh. That's delicious. Should my throat be swollen up? I love that so much. It just, it just makes you think sometimes anyway. So guys, I'll put the link as well for his, actually, I think I have already, but I'll check to make sure we'll put David's links in below. The really fun, short, little comedic sketches in a way, but in an educational format. And I think we'll leave it there. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Everyone yeah, at home, thank you for being with us and your questions as well. Um, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Let yeah, me. It's been great being on here. It's been super fun. Oh, and Strider is Strider there. Uh, I can get him. Go on then. Let's let's see Strider before he before he leaves us. So Strider is this beautiful. Um, I don't actually. I've forgotten what the breed is. What what breed is Strider again? Uh, German Shepherd, Norwegian Elkhound, and Malamute. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. You sit. Come on. Yeah, come here. Sit. There you go. Look this way. Can you see him? That's yeah, him. we can see him. Okay. He'll go away now. That's him. <laughs> Brilliant. So, from everyone at home, that is it. See you all next week. Once I find a way to end this live stream, because <laughs> I lost it. <laughs> I've lost the link, everyone. I'm sorry. Let me find it on this computer. Are you going to go take Strider for a walk now? 
Um, or is he actually quite happy? We're still live, by the way. Oh. Um, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't find the link to take us offline. I've lost it. Sorry, guys at home. I am using, I'm not using my computer. Um, and I have lost where you are in the world. <laughs> 